Uh, I'm Steve Call. I'm the president of the New America Foundation, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this event uh, briefly and to introduce our subject, which uh, from our perspective involves uh, the launch of a book that uh, somebody will hold up for the audience since I don't have a copy, uh, Talibanistan. <laughs> and uh, I just wanted to say a few words about uh, where this book came from and why the subject matter that you'll hear uh, discussed today um, struck us as, as worthy of what became really a couple of years of endeavor at New America led by Peter Bergen, who will be your host and moderator through most of uh, the program today. Uh, Peter and Catherine Tiedemann, who unfortunately is not here with us today, uh, co-edited this book from Oxford University Press. It's a collection of scholarly and journalistic articles about uh, the Taliban and its environment in southern Afghanistan and western Pakistan. And it was uh, born as an attempt at New America uh, by a diverse group of researchers to try to get at some of the diversity of the Taliban itself at a time when the United States was really puzzling over uh, its resurgence as a movement, as a political force in Afghanistan, as a military challenge, and uh, really a challenge that had been neglected in the years after the 2001 defeat of the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan, and which uh, revived and presented itself as a, as a really grave dilemma to the Obama administration as it arrived in 2009. And so our effort was to do what think tanks do, which is just to try to provide some ground truth and some complexity and some granularity about uh, this, this phenomenon, recognizing that the, the sort of cliched image of um, a one-eyed mullah and his uh, band of devoted and intractable fanatics was inadequate uh, and, and really falsifying of the problem. And, and so the purpose was uh, not to prosecute a particular view of the Taliban, but just to start to document some sections of its, of, of its diversity and some aspects of its character that were otherwise um, uh, not part of American debate and discourse. So I'm really, really proud of this book and of Peter, particularly, whose leadership of the National Security Studies Program at New America over the last uh, five years has been one of my joys uh, in my office just to, to support him and to watch him. And uh, Catherine as well, who uh, worked very, very hard. The last thing I want to say is that this book and the, the ideas and the research in it is really part of a much uh, broader body of work about South Asia that we've been uh, engaged in here over the last five years, the AFPAC channel. I hope many of you are subscribers and readers, uh, which we've uh, carried out in collaboration with Foreign Policy and uh, lots of other uh, conferences and publications around uh, South Asian affairs. Um, so uh, anyway, we're all very pleased to have this occasion to bring us together, and the purpose today is to have a very serious discussion about the ideas and subjects uh, that are in the book and that are obviously still alive as dilemmas for American foreign policy. So uh, let me uh, introduce Peter and welcome him to the podium. Thank you. Thank you, Steve, and thank you for uh, all of you coming today and, and uh, for C-SPAM for covering this. Um, Steve was <clears throat> instrumental in making this whole project happen, so I'm very grateful to him. Thank you also to Oxford University Press, which published the book um, and did, a, I think, a fine job in terms of presenting the material. Um, thank you also to my co-editor, Catherine Tiedemann, um, and thanks also to people here at the Foundation, Brian Fishman, Patrick Doherty, um, Jennifer Rowland and Andrew Leibovich, who were also involved in uh, making the book possible. As Steve indicated, the reason that we felt uh, this project was necessary, initially it was a series of papers, was not since the Khmer Rouge um, stormed on the world stage out of the woods of Cambodia in the 1970s had an insurgent movement uh, become so important, yet at the same, same time so under... Uh, l less well understood than any other insurgent movement in, in, in the modern era. And, um, you know, obviously we had Ahmed Rashid's great book on the Taliban, but it seemed that that was very much the pre-9-11 Taliban, and we wanted to focus on how did the Taliban develop after 9-11. And uh, we have uh, uh, some dozen chapters in the book, uh, six people here on the stage who contributed to the book, 
Uh, Anand Gopal, who's a fellow here at the New America Foundation, who's writing a, a book on Afghanistan, has the first chapter in the book. And really, that chapter, which he'll explain in more detail, asks the question, is, in a sense, was the Taliban insurgency inevitable, uh, particularly as it relates to the Kandahari Taliban immediately after 9-11? Were there efforts by that movement to essentially negotiate with the Afghan government, which unfortunately uh, were not followed up on? Um, we also have uh, on the stage Hassan Abbas, who's a professor at National Defense Uni University and a former professor at Columbia, also a former high-ranking uh, Pakistani police official, who really examines uh, what is now uh, the political s scene in what was the Northwest Frontier Province, now Khyber Pakhtunwa, in a sense the political ecosystem in which the Pakistani Taliban is able to swim, because while groups like the MMA are, are not the Taliban, they're certainly uh, sufficiently aligned with the Taliban uh, to allow it the political space that it enjoyed in the 2008-2009 time period when there was quite a lot of denial uh, about the Pakistani Taliban and the threat that it really posed to the Pakistani state. Uh, next to Anand is Brian Fishman. Brian uh, is a fellow here at New America Foundation. He's also, he also works at Palantir, a company with which many of you are familiar. Brian uh, worked on two chapters, uh, also one with Anand, uh, one really looking at the Haqqani network in some detail. Uh, Anand is probably the only person in the room, I'm pretty sure, probably the only person watching who's actually met Siraj Haqqani, the de facto leader of the Haqqani network. Uh, Brian also worked with him on that uh, chapter and also did a very interesting chapter where he kind of stepped back and looked at, in a sense, the typology of all the different Taliban groups and asked certain questions. Do they attack the Pakistani state or not? Do they attack U.S. NATO forces in Afghanistan or not? Do they take direction from Mullah Omar or not? Um, and uh, a very interesting uh, cap uh, way of capturing the sort of typology of the different Taliban groups. To Brian's right um, is uh, Ken Ballin, who's one of the leading pollsters in the Muslim world. He helped us with a poll, the first poll that really looked at the political, um, sensitive political questions in the federally administered tribal regions. Obviously, polling in, in Fatah is pretty tricky for all, all sorts of obvious reasons. Uh, we had a very good partner on the ground called CAMP, uh, based in Peshawar. Ken uh, helped us really think about how to make this poll a, a truly scientific poll. He will explain some of the findings of that poll. He'll also, uh, he's written a book, Terrorists in Love, which uh, uh, is a, a almost anthropological account of uh, jihadis and why they uh, join certain groups. And he'll also talk a little bit about what he learned about Mullah Omar in the process of writing that book. To the right of uh, Ken Ballon is Colonel Tom Lynch, who served on Admiral Mullen's uh, staff and uh, is now at National Defense University along with Hassan Abbas. Uh, he uh, has written, I think, an absolutely fascinating chapter and essentially on the strategic defeat of al-Qaeda and what that means and what the United States should do about it going forward in Afghanistan. Of course, this is not necessarily a popular view among certain circles in in, in Washington, D.C., for instance, we want to say somehow the attack in Benghazi is proof of an al-Qaeda resurgence. I think uh, Colonel Lynch will, uh, will deal with that question in his, in his remarks. And finally, Samir Lawani at the end of the row. Uh, Samir is a fellow here. He's a Ph.D. candidate at MIT. And he uh, has a very interesting chapter in the book about Pakistan counterinsurgency operations, um, which have actually been, I think, quite effective. I mean, we, we have uh, had our own problems with counterinsurgency in, in uh, in Afghanistan, <clears throat> arguably, the Pakistani military did a better job in SWAT than we've done in m m most of Afghanistan. So with that, um, I'll turn it over. We'll just go down the road this way. We'll start with Hassan Abbas. Thank you very much, uh, Peter. First and foremost, um, I really congratulate you on the book and uh, the great work done by New America Foundation on militancy in South Asia. FPAC channel is, is really a great contribution and a great source uh, for research um, for students um, everywhere, not only in the US, but uh, also in South Asia. Um, I just actually um, returned from Pakistan about 48 hours ago, and I was just joking with a friend that out of my three days in Pakistan, about two and a half days were spent on um, discussing Tahir al-Qadri, a new phenomena, um, a, a religious player who has just gone back to Pakistan. And this has become, in the recent uh, months, kind of a new phenomena. Many major political leaders holding big rallies um, with hundreds of thousands of people uh, coming up with new agendas, coming up with new slogans, and now with um, elections coming um, 
in, in three months or so, there's a lot of political activity. But I'll focus in about the remaining seven minutes that I'm given uh, on um, Northwest Frontier Province. And I also want to um, add, given my position in a government organization, that um, all that I'm saying today and my views are my personal views and not representative of NDU or DOD. Um, the landscape, the political landscape in what was called the, the, Khyber, the Northwest Frontier Province, and now known as Khyber Pakhtunkhwa Province, um, th that's what I focused on. Um, this is the settled area of Pashtuns. Uh, we, we often focus on the unsettled area of Pashtuns, which is federally administered tribal area between Pakistan and Afghanistan, with about six or seven million people. But we often get to, to look at uh, the, the adjoining or adjacent settled area, uh, which the British had framed it like that, which is about 25 districts, 20, 20 million people, perhaps a bit more than um, all the Pashtuns together in Afghanistan. So this is very critical. This is the connection between FATA and the rest of the mainstream Pakistan, if I may call that. Uh, what happened there in the last um, 10 years or so had a huge impact on how Taliban, the Pakistani Taliban came into being, um, how there was the genesis, how they established their roots, how in a step-by-step -step fashion they expanded their space. Um, that's why... Uh, this area, what I'll just now call KPP, short for Khyber Pakhtunkhwa province, that's why it is important. And I only have about three or four points um, to focus on here. One is that one of the reasons why the genesis of, of or, or creation of or uh, mushrooming of tehreek e taliban Pakistan or TTP became a reality was that there was this government of all major religious political parties um, in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa province or KPP. Uh, this was from 2002 up to 2008 or 2007. Um, this religious political alliance, and these are those political parties which believe in a democratic process. These are not the terrorist groups or, or the, like the LET or TTP or other groups which, which believe in militancy. These are the groups which believe in a democratic process. Um, they have their declared political agendas, their, their manifestos, their websites. And one positive thing, if I may call that, was that this, this group of five different politi religious political parties represented um, Sunni groups within the Sunni Muslims, uh, the Ubandis, Barelvis, uh, Ahle Hadith, which are more closer to um, the the Saudi version or Wahhabism and the Shia group as well. Um, so in principle, it looked like a good combination Well, all the different religious political parties are coming together. But And this was the first opportunity this group had to rule or run uh, a province. But the, react, the results of that were, um, if I may call that, devastating. Because that they, their policies created a space. They were not directly supporting militancy or terrorism, not at all. Uh, but they, some of their orthodox, conservative, narrow-minded policies, um, or looking the other way, when they saw militant groups operating, that created the space for this new networking or connectivity between FATA and, if I may call, uh, the militants who were in Punjab. Um, if you remember, during the Musharraf years, uh, various militant groups were banned. Um, so they all started moving from Punjab, uh, from the south of Punjab, where it was they were somewhat closer or they were more organized in that area to go to India. And then they were banned. Pakistan military st stopped um, any kind of connections with many of those groups. What they did, they started moving from Punjab through KPP to FATA, and then some of them moved on to Afghanistan. This was the responsibility uh, in the KPP province to stop them or go after them. Pakistan had lacked capability to do that, uh, to stop them, because the counterterrorism money, all the investment was made um, not in the law, civilian law enforcement <laughs> or civilian intelligence agencies, which could have really stopped that. Um, so that, that's a large, um, I would say, a failure or a, a, a gap uh, that created, that provided this opportunity for all this TTP activity. Um, three other points. Um, one is about Sawat. Um, Sawat operation, as um, Peter had hinted, was indeed a successful operation. I think Pakistan military deserves credit for that. Uh, but I was just reading the latest figures of 2012, and it said there were about 17 major attacks from Taliban groups that were repulsed in Sawat. They were 105 different firefights because Fazlullah and some of those Sawat militants have gone into Afghanistan. 
Um, and this is a contentious issue. Pakistan government is arguing uh, some of the Taliban are attacking Pakistan uh, or Sabat from the other side. So that's a big issue. The, the uh, stabilization or the consolidation of, of the peace has not happened. Um, there's a successful de-radicalization process that is going on. About um, 2,000 of these militants are, being, are going through that process. So that, that's one study, uh, when one important factor, uh, successful but not fully successful or st still in transition. Uh, the history or the modern history of Khyber Pakhtunkhwa cannot be completed unless I salute um, two, two people especially. One is Bashir Belor, uh, a leading Awami National Party, a very brave and courageous man who survived three suicide attacks um, and then um, he, he knew fully well uh, that Taliban were after him. So he stood his ground, was killed in a suicide attack recently. Malala Yousafzai, another, another icon, uh, who, who have taken up a stand, as important as it is, and this I have made this point in the chapter as well, as important as it is to profile militant groups and militant leaders, it is as important to salute and to appreciate all the great and courageous people who are standing up to these things. Uh, Bushra Gohar, uh, another ANP uh, woman leader who despite threats is standing up. Uh, but also the tragic part is that some of the leading police officers and um, one of the leading uh, very well-known Pakistani police officers is in, in the audience and I'm reminded of that. Three <coughs> famous senior police officers were killed in Peshawar in, in um, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa province. Um, so also there's this challenge that civilian law enforcement faces that they have not been able to defend those brave people. And if these courageous people who are standing up to Taliban fall one by one, um, then it creates a, a scary scene. So these are the, I think, the important currents. Um, I think I've finished with my eight minutes or so. But I want just to focus on, um, just to leave you with this idea. Um, there's a successful case of Sawat. But the de-radicalization process, we don't know whether how far it will go. Those gains have to be consolidated. Awami National Party, a progressive political party, um, was voted in because people, never, the ordinary people of this province reacted against MMA, that religious alliance which I was mentioning had created that space. So ordinary people in Pakistan and in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa have been doing the right thing. They have been voting in the good people. They have been voting out the, uh, the, the uh, problematic uh, forces in, in a limited sense with all the caveats. Uh, but without good governance, without investment in education, um, Fata, uh, the Khyber Pakhtunkhwa province will not be able to come out of the crisis it is in. Um, 768 schools bombed in the area. 58 schools bombed in this province, uh, in this um, year, last year, 2012. Uh, I have not seen any major effort on the part of Pakistani political government or military government um, to, to um, take up these major causes of investing in education or infrastructure. Unless that is done, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa will, um, the, the status quo in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa will not change. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to focus uh, on the Afghan Taliban, which is a completely different beast than the Pakistani Taliban. Uh, my chapter, uh, my chapter on Kandahar, which is the one I'm going to focus on, really covers 2002 to 2004 as the major period. And, and the reason I did this is because I believe that the patterns of conflict that we see today really were locked in by 2004. And, you know, I, I went back before this and sort of looked through the chapter and I was trying to think about what, you know, what can we actually glean from that period that would be relevant for today. But... I was surprised to see that, in fact, most of what most of the dynamics that are taking place on the ground in 2002 and 2003 in Afghanistan and in Kandahar are completely relevant for what's happening today. Um, and and what I see is happening today is two key, two key questions that we need to sort of grapple with. Right? Uh, the first is what happens when the U.S. leaves, if the U.S. leaves, uh, and the second is do the Taliban want to negotiate? And for both of those questions, I, I think uh, the chapter in, in this book, uh, you know, is, is very useful in this regard. Uh, and there's a lot in there. I, I believe it's the longest uh, chapter, probably. Yeah. Uh, um, but so I'm only going to focus on on those elements which speak directly to these two issues. Um, and so, after 2001, you know, the Taliban were routed and 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 you know left in in, in shame and defeat, and and the people of Afghanistan uh, welcomed that for the most part. Um, and Al-Qaeda 
if you recall, at the time, um, they fled to Tora Bora, and then they went to Pakistan, they declared jihad. And at the time, watching this from afar, I assumed that the Taliban uh, had essentially had the same position, that they were declaring jihad with the, with the infidels, with the foreign occupiers. It was only after Peter asked me to, to um, f study Kandahar and the, the Kandahar insurgency and going to Kandahar and really trying to grapple with what's happening there that I actually came to a, a different conclusion than what I had uh, originally thought. And, and in short, that is that after 2001, the Taliban had quit, essentially. Um, they had quit wholesale. And, and what I mean by that is that the Taliban, the people who today constitute the insurgency, from the leadership to the rank and file, had quit and tried for the most part to, um, cut, to engineer a series of deals with the Afghan government, or in some cases with the Americans directly. Um, and, and it's interesting because I, I dug up a quote. Uh, was, at the time, and this is 2002, there were Pakistani clerics, radical clerics, that are trying to drum up support for the fallen Taliban. And they're saying, you know, we need to, we need to send money to the Taliban so they can fight the occupiers. Um, um, but this is a quote from somebody who is a relative of Mullah Omar and a, a very high-ranking person in the Taliban. And he said at the time, this is in, in late 2001, after the, after the government had fallen, he said, we want to tell the people that the Taliban system is no more. They should not give any donations in the name of the Taliban. If a stable Islamic government is established in Afghanistan, we won't launch, we won't launch any action against it. And, and you know, on, on one level this may seem surprising, but on another level, if you look at the broad sweep of Afghan history over the last 30 odd years, it's really not that surprising. Because what, what you see when you look at uh, Afghan history in the last three decades is a, a large number of factions that are fighting against each other that switch allegiances um, over the years, and they're driven by the exigencies of survival, essentially. And so with the Taliban particularly, they took power in 1994, starting in Kandahar, and what they did is they displaced a lot of uh, power brokers or warlords, and they gave these warlords an option in the South, essentially, you know, submit to us and surrender your weapons and sit at home and, and, you know, give up politics altogether and, you know, we'll let you live, uh, or if not, we'll fight you. And so some of them fled to Pakistan and some of them stayed in Afghanistan and, and did as they were told. And it, talking to the Taliban leadership, a lot of them expected the same thing, um, in the 2002-2003 period. Um, and so what you had in that period, in 2002 to 2004 specifically, is you had more or less the entire leadership of the Taliban. Uh, and I'm talking the Minister of Interior, Defense, Information, Justice, Foreign Affairs, key frontline commanders, um, key sort of advisors for Mullah Omar, who's the supreme leader of the Taliban, cut deals with the Afghan government, and in some cases attempted to cut deals with the US. I mean, and, and this holds for even the most ideological people in the Taliban. So my, my one example is Mullah, Mullah Tarabi, who was um, in the Ministry, Ministry of Justice, and, in, and he was one of the ideologues for the most draconian social policies for the Taliban. So the, the whip-wielding religious police, uh, the people who would go around and check people's beard lengths, et cetera. Uh, even he surrendered and cut a deal with the, with the Afghan government in 2002. Um, and along with them were thousands of foot soldiers who did the same. And, and so there was, a, there was an opening there for a broad political settlement, but um, unfortunately it didn't come to pass. And, and this is why I think um, the years of 2002 to 2004 are relevant for what's happening today. Because again, today the question is whether a broad political settlement, settlement is, on the card, is in the cards or not. Um, but what the Taliban leadership found in 2002 and 2003 was that a settlement was not in the offing. Um, instead, every single deal that was engineered was at some point overturned for various different reasons. So I'll give you an example. So I mentioned Mullah Tarabi, who is the ideologue, one of the ideologues of, of the draconianism uh, that took place. Tarabi turned himself in in January of 2002 to the governor of, of Kandahar province, Gulaga Shirzai. And they, did a, they arranged a deal through tribal intermediaries, which is how it usually works in, in Afghanistan. And the, the terms of the deal were that uh, Chirabi would give up any rights to political life. He would surrender whatever assets he had in terms of vehicles, et cetera. He would then retire to his home village. Uh, he would publicly pledge support for the, for the Afghan government, the Karzai government, and for the Americans. And he uh, would uh, agree to be... Uh, uh, sort of uh, monitored by the Afghan government. So they would have somebody coming every week to his village to see uh, what he was doing. And he retired to a life of preaching. 
Uh, now, news of this uh, came to D.C., came to Rumsfeld particularly, and, and Rumsfeld was furious about this, and it leaked out into the press. You can go back and look at the archives then and see what people in the administration then were saying about this. And the, idea, the conception that was what we were making deals with terrorists, and that's unacceptable. Uh, and so a lot of pressure was placed on the Afghan government, and particularly on the governor of, of Kandahar, then, who had engineered the deal. And so he went, or his people went to Tarabi and said, look, we're, getting, we're under a lot of pressure, and we cannot guarantee um, your safety here in Afghanistan, so you should go to Pakistan. And he fled to Pakistan. Um, and this sort of, this instance, this case was played out again and again in Kandahar and around the country. Uh, another example which is particularly pertinent for today is uh, Hairullah Hairkhwa. Uh, he was a um, former interior minister under the Taliban, um, also a very important uh, provincial governor, and he was uh, also, he's a Popolzai, which is a tribe of uh, Hamid Karzai. So he had tribal links to the Karzais. After 2001, he had uh, repudiated the Taliban, and he was seeking to find a way to join the Afghan government and join the, uh, join the Karzais, essentially. And so he contacted Ahmed Wali Karzai, uh, Hamid Karzai's brother, and he uh, wanted to engineer a deal, again, to see if there's a way that he can join the government. So the meeting took place, or the meeting was scheduled to take place in Chaman in, on the border between uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan. Now the Pakistanis uh, caught wind of this, and they were none too pleased with the, the idea of Taliban joining the Karzai government. And so they told the Americans that Khairullah Khairkhwa is in such and such place. The Ameri and they, I believe they arrested him, handed him over to the Americans, and now uh, and the Americans sent him to Guantanamo. And he's still in Guantanamo today. And, and he's a particularly inter interesting case because a lot of the uh, sort of talks about talks or negotiation, sort of nascent negotiations that are taking place are about prisoner releases from Guantanamo. And he's one of the five uh, Taliban prisoners that uh, the Taliban are seeking to release. So here, this, these are just two examples, but this is, you know, you can go across the board. And, and the chapter goes into a lot more detail about a lot of this. And as this was happening on the leadership level, we also had on the rank and file level, you know, night raids, um, the Afghan government was, um, it has been implicated in torture, in um, uh, human rights abuses, not just towards former Taliban members, but also towards people whom the Afghan government or whom the Americans perceived as being aligned with the Taliban. So this would be clans or tribes or communities um, in which the Taliban had traditionally drawn recruits from. Uh, and through all of these processes, again, and there's some detail in the book, uh, in, in the chapter on this, you had a sense amongst people who either were once in the Taliban or people who had been in communities from which the Taliban were drawn, that there was no space in the political system, in the post-2001 political system for them. And so these people like Khairullah Khairullah, well not him, but sorry, uh, Mullah Turabi and others were uh, relocated to Pakistan, to Quetta, and, re and the um, Taliban was reconstituted, essentially. Um, and you know, having talked to a lot of these people who were in their process in 2002 and 2003, what, what's striking to me is, is how relevant that seems to be t today in, in trying to understand whether the Taliban are open uh, to negotiations or not. Um, so in my sense, there's broadly speaking two camps in the Taliban. One is, one are, one are people who are mostly political. And by political, I mean they're not frontline commanders. They're not on the ground in Afghanistan leading fighters. Rather, they're people like former ministers of education, ministers of culture, religious ideal, uh, ideologues, or people who are in Mullah Omar's inner circle who recognize today, and these are the same people who had desperately tried to reconcile in 2002 and 2003, and they recognize that the Taliban are not going to win this war. And I think, you know, to me it's clear the Taliban are not gonna win this war, and they recognize that. And therefore, coming out of, the, uh, out of this, this very practical need, uh, there's an opening, or they have, they have a sort of orientation towards trying to find a negotiated settlement. And there's you know, 10 or 15 people today in Doha who are Taliban leadership. There's a, f uh, you know, a dozen people who are in Abu Dhabi, in, and, and there's a couple of people in, in Turkey, um, and as well as people in, in, in Pakistan right now. Um, and so that's, to me, constitutes one sort of 
click uh, very informally. So a click of, of the Taliban leadership. And, and a second grouping is what I think of as the military side. By military, again, I mean people who are actually, they themselves not, may not be on the ground in Afghanistan leading fighters, but they are the ones who are directing the insurgency on a day-to-day -day level. And um, these are people who either, for the most part, distrust the U.S.'s intentions in, in negotiated settlement, or um, in talking to some of them, they frequently point to the 2002 to 2004 period and say, look what happened when the last time we tried to reconcile. And some of these people, by the way, are people who actually tried to cut deals with the Americans in 2002 and 2003 and um, were rebuffed and, and now are on the military <coughs> side. Um, and there's a sense amongst these, these people that, you know, we will just wait out the Americans until 2014. And, and talking to them as well, there's a, there's a sense that they believe they can reconstitute the 90s Taliban. You know, I think that's a fantasy, but they believe that they're very close to that. And you know, if they just hold on a little bit longer, they can do that. Um, and, and so, and I should say, by the way, that these categories that I'm putting forth, they're very fast and loose, they're heuristics. They're, you shouldn't reify them into real groups, but just as ways to try to understand the differing positions that are right now in the Taliban. Um, and, Talking to all of these people uh, within the Taliban and people around the Taliban and also ordinary Afghans, you know, there's, there's a very heavy fo focus on troop numbers. You know, uh, I believe Karzai is, has probably landed today, right, in, in the U.S. And, and there's going to be talk about whether it's going to be 6,000 or 9,000 or 3,000 troops in Afghanistan. And, and that's important, and a lot of rural Afghans in, in the villages where the war is actually being fought would say we want zero troops and not three or six or 9,000. But there's another question that I would like to raise, which is something I think in my discussion with the Taliban, they, they actually don't think about, it, nor with most other people who are um, actually think about these things in Afghanistan, which is that what we're facing today in Afghanistan is, is a question of state formation. And this is similar to the questions we were facing in 2002 to 2004. And that's why I think some of the, um, some of the findings in the chapter are still useful. And what I mean by that is that I believe that the U.S. has never seriously attempted to build the Afghan state. If you look at the 2002 to 2004 period, what, has, what happened is on the one hand, they poured money and expertise into the center, into Kabul, to uh, Karzai's government. Um, but at the same time, we had a number of independent and unilateral agreements with people in the periphery. Uh, this would be, uh, for example, the governor of Kandahar in 2002, Gulag al or, you know, there's a series of private militias that were um, funded and supported. So while we were give, putting money in to, crea uh, to create the Afghan police, we were also giving money to Gulag al the governor of Kandahar, for him to maintain his private militia. And this is a militia that doesn't answer to the Afghan government in any way. It answers to Shirzai alone and perhaps to the special forces. Um, and you can't create a state under these conditions. I mean, if you think of a state in the very basic definition of a body that uh, has a monopoly over the means of violence, I mean, there's a series of actors that exist around the country from 2002 to today which preclude the formation of a viable state. Um, to, to give an example, there are probably 100, maybe 200 military bases scattered, U.S. military bases scattered around the country in Afghanistan. Now each of those, or most of those, require Afghan militiamen to guard. And these are not pol Afghan police, and these are not Afghan army. These are irregular militiamen that we call private security contractors to guard. To supply each of these bases, we require uh, convoys that need to be protected from insurgent attacks. And the people who protect these convoys, for the most part, are again, militiamen, warlords, and strongmen. Each of them are e either being paid directly by the U.S. military or they're paying, being paid indirectly by the Department of Defense through various subcontracting regimes. Right? So this is, and there's been various estimates on how many of these people are, actually exist. And we're talking, you know, if you include the private security contractors in Kabul, maybe 50, 60, 70,000 young men who, are, uh, who, who have arms who do not fall under the Afghan government's purview whatsoever. And they all owe their existence entirely to foreign patronage. So the question is, what happens when the money stops flowing? Along with them, the Afghan state itself. The Afghan state doesn't collect its revenues through taxation. It collects its revenues almost entirely through foreign patronage. So again, the question is, what happens when the money stops flowing? Now we have one uh, case uh, that we can look to, which was uh, in the 80s, 
This is very similar to what the Russians, what the Soviets had. The Soviets had militias, or the Afghan communist government had militias around the country. Um, patronage f flowed from Moscow to Kabul and then outwards into the provinces. And it was only, it, it, the Russians left Afghanistan in 1989, but the civil war started in 1992. And it started in 1992 because the money stopped flowing in 1992. Um, and these are sort of the questions I think we face. And you can draw these questions out, I think, from the chapter in, in this book. My notes are on the phone. Um, Thanks very much. I want to I want to thank New America and, and Peter and Steve for for hosting this event. It's great to be on a on a panel with all these folks, and to go after Anand. I I do want to sort of reemphasize the point that Peter made. When you read uh, any of the chapters that Anand has written, you really have to read look at the references. I mean, more so than with your average chapter, they're really pretty incredible. Um, so what, what I'd like to talk about is, is some of the semantics. My sort of task in this, in this effort was to step back and, and look at the bigger picture. And one of the things that came out of that process when we were originally pulling together these chapters, um, and these chapters do hold up over time, as Anand said, I, I really think that some of the basic dynamics are still there, even as conditions have changed. Some of these people have been, some of the individuals and, and personalities have been killed. Um, some of the political dynamics have changed a little bit, but, but fundamentally, you see the same issues at play. Um, and so, semantically, when, when we were pulling these together, there was this division that we often made between, you know, so-called Afghan Taliban and Pakistani Taliban. And that's something that, that that I thought at the time was a, uh, a a sort of false construct that gave us that that created a uh, a false distinction that um, that uh, obscured some of the the cross pollination between these kinds of groups and didn't really shed a lot of light on the strategic differences between them. You see a new version of that even in the last couple of days where there has been reporting in, in our newspapers about a drone strike that killed a, uh, a Taliban commander in South Waziristan named Mullah Nazir. So Mullah Nazir, in, in, and if you go just look at the headlines, you'll see is often referred to as good Taliban um, versus bad Taliban. And the distinction there that gets made uh, is one around whether or not this is a Taliban figure that attacks the Pakistani state. Well, that is a really critical question, um, and it is quite important. But that sort of normative judgment uh, also obscures a lot, uh, a lot of complexity that we need to be considering when we think about these folks. I mean, after all, um, smart people in the US government decided that he wasn't all that good of a Taliban. Um, and wherever you sit on drone strikes, there are smart people that, that think that he deserved one. Um, so what are the questions that we should be asking about these militant groups? And I'm just going to run through the six that we identified uh, when these chapters were written. And I think they still hold up. The other thing that I would point out um, is that a, a slight tweak of these questions should be used in all settings where we have militants that are associated with al-Qaeda. Um, and the Taliban is not al-Qaeda, but they are associated with al-Qaeda. And I think that when we've got local groups that are associated with a transnational militant organization, there is a, a version of these questions needs to be asked, whether it's in Syria, in North Africa, in Iraq, in Yemen, uh, in Mali, wherever. Um, so. <coughs> The better solution, six questions. The first one is the, is the key strategic question that the good versus bad Taliban gets at, which is, does the militant group attack Pakistan? The reason why this is fundamental is because it shapes their local environment, and it uh, fundamentally um, frames how they are going to be interacting with the organization that has the most power on the ground, which is still the Pakistani military. Um, if we look at Mullah Nazir, for example, uh, this is somebody that did, over time, generally have a, a more positive relationship with the Pakistani government than, than other militants in, in the Fatah. Mullah Nazir came to power um, in 2004, only after a previous drone strike, U.S. drone strike, killed his primary rival, Nek Mohammed. At the time, Mullah Nazir was in a Pakistani prison, which I don't know exactly how to put it, but that allows for a lot of negotiation with the Pakistani state. He was then released and, and sort of took uh, a, a leading role um, among the Ahmadzai Wazirs in South Waziristan. Um, 
So, you know, Mullen Azir was ended by a drone strike, but in many ways his leadership started with, with a drone strike as well. Um, second question is what are the group's tribal and social roots, right? This is a, obviously a key question because while we tend to look at uh, conflicts in terms of how these organizations and how these networks face the United States, oftentimes that's not the most crucial question to the groups on the ground. Right? And sometimes it's very difficult to understand exactly what those histories are, but as these groups build relationships, as they negotiate the politics of the region, um, those are the questions that they ask. What are my social roots? Who can I trust? Who can I not trust? Um, and so if we're going to understand these organizations and develop a policy towards these organizations, those are the questions we have to ask. The third, um, what are the militant group's relationship with foreign fighters? Well, in the case of Mullah Nazir, um, it really varies. And you have to ask, what kind of foreign fighters? Mullah Nazir, over time, had a pretty good relationship with al-Qaeda. And I imagine that the, the targeteers um, guiding the drone strike recently would point to the, that relationship over time. But Mullah Nazir clashed repeatedly with Uzbek militants associated with the IMU and the IJU. And as a result, he clashed with other uh, Taliban elements in South Waziristan that had allied with those militants. So when we look at, you know, somebody like Mullah Nazir's relationship with those other organizations, we really have to sort of um, get down to fine points about how he's framing his politics. Fourth, how aggressively do these folks target international troops in Afghanistan, right? This is another obviously key strategic question. Well, in the case of Mullah Nazir, this is a pretty obvious one. He supported attacks against U.S. troops in Afghanistan, worked closely with the Haqqani network over time to do so. Um, but that's not the case for every militant network in the Fatah. Um, there are plenty of criminal organizations. The most famous probably was probably Mango Baz um, in, uh, in, in the Khyber area that... Um, that uh, fought other militant organizations, right? So this is, a, this is a key question. It's a key question for US policy going forward. It's a key question for understanding how the Pakistani state is going to look at these organizations, right? Um, obviously, this is important to us. It's not as important to the ISI in terms of how they're going to define their relationship with these organizations. Does the militant group engage or support attacks on Western civilian targets? Right? The reason why this one is, is important is because it obviously defines a relationship certainly with al-Qaeda and al-Qaeda's globalized mission and attacks on civilians. Mullah Nazir was never publicly implicated in a, a global attack, which distinguishes him from some of the other Pakistani militants that were. Baitullah Massoud, for example, was uh, pointed to for a plot that would have taken place in uh, Barcelona, Spain. Um, wasn't, uh, it was disrupted by the Spanish police, but that was a really interesting one where you did have a fundamentally local Pakistani militant looking to attack abroad in an Al-Qaeda style format, right? Mullah Nazir, to, to my knowledge at least, um, was not implicated in that way, but, and this is total speculation, but one of the questions that I would ask about somebody like this, somebody that had a long close relationships with the Haqqani network. Siraj Haqqani intervened on Mullah Nazir's behalf as he was re negotiating relations with uh, the Tariqi Taliban Pakistan in 2008, is whether or not some of these other militants engaged and supported some of the Haqqani network uh, terrorist-style attacks in the heart of Kabul over the last couple of years. That's the kind of question that would, I think, change the way people thought about these kinds of organizations. Um, and then the last one is, does the group take operational direction from Mullah Omar? Everybody rhetorically supports Mullah Omar. But I think um, one of the things that we need to be very careful of, especially as researchers that don't have the kind of source network and access that, that Anand has, um, is to be very careful with what these guys say. And that goes for the Taliban. It also goes for Al Qaeda, right? Um, the, the heart of being a terrorist organization or an insurgent network that needs to uh, create a lot of power out of relatively little on the ground force is that you have to create myths about yourself, right? That's at the heart of terrorism is to create myths, to create political power out of, you know, relatively small amounts of, of force. And so you do that with strategic communications. You do that 
with attacks that are going to get a lot of attention. You do that with attacks that are going to generate a lot of publicity. Um, and you do that by building a sense of coherence and cohesiveness within a, uh, a range of organizations that are really running in all sorts of different directions. Right? And I think that's one of the things that you see um, with the Taliban, is that you've got a lot of different sub-organizations running in all sorts of different directions. And why that's important is because understanding those networks and understanding the internal tensions within these, within these milieus gives us tools for undermining them, right? Um, I, I've, you know, I've heard it said and in, in sort of a you know, been criticized at times for, for saying, look, we need to dig deeper and we need to understand, we need to, I, I don't want to use the word empathize, but we need to really put ourselves in the shoes of some of these organizations to understand how they understand the world. But the reason why we need to do that is not so that we can understand why they're able and how they're able to exploit the drone strikes in order to recruit. It's so that we can understand how they operate so that we can undermine them, right? And we understand what they're afraid of. Um, so we can undermine them. Um, the last thing that I'm that I'm going to say, and that's this right. This is this is a model that is not just applicable in in Pakistan. Mullah Nazir, by the way, um, had close relationships rhetorically with Mullah Omar, and Mullah Omar reportedly intervened on his behalf again in 2006 to to keep him in a, in a leadership position in South Waziristan. So that does look like a pretty close operational relationship, at least as far as it goes. Um, the last thing I'm going to say just uh, going forward is on the future of Afghanistan, I could not agree more with what Anand was saying about the money issue in Afghanistan. I, I wrote a paper published here by New America called Russian Roulette, and I forget the subtitle, uh, that runs through and does a comparison of the, the last days of the Russian occupation in Afghanistan in the late 80s with where we are today. And frankly, I don't think from a sustainability of the Afghan government standpoint, we've done much better. And, and that's pretty depressing, but I think that's the case. Um, and we may have done worse, because um, I think in a lot of ways you could, you could make the, a strong argument that Najibullah was a more dynamic and creative leader than Hamid Karzai. Um, so the last thing, though, is, is where do we go going forward? And I think, um, especially in the Fatah, right, we have a, uh, a strategy of very effective tactics, meaning the drone strikes. Um, those aren't going to defeat the Taliban, and they're not going to fundamentally defeat al-Qaeda, in my view. Um, I think they will suppress the Taliban and al-Qaeda. Um, and I think it's possible that al-Qaeda in particular will, uh, will sort of, you know, defeat itself the last, you know, the last 10 yards or so. Um, because, uh, you know, they, they've lost a lot of really important people. Um, and their ideology is fundamentally at conflict with itself. Um, but when it comes to the Taliban, I'm not as optimistic as, as a non, because I am quite pessimistic about the Afghan government. And I don't think that what we will see is the Taliban sort of rushing with armored columns back into Kabul, but I do think that uh, civil war in Afghanistan is a real possibility uh, in the years after an American withdrawal, particularly if uh, particularly if the money stops flowing in the way that it did um, after the Soviets left. And, you know, that, that's how the Taliban got there in the first place. They didn't defeat Najibullah on their own, right? They, they, they rose after the Afghan government had been shattered by civil war. And I think the, the danger comes not in the first three or four years. The danger from the Taliban or some reflection of it comes not in the first three or four years after an American withdrawal, but in the next five. Um, and, uh, and if you can get through that first, you know, five years without civil war, maybe you make it. Um, but, uh, but I worry very much that, uh, that that's not going to happen. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Peter uh, Bergen and uh, Steve Cole in New America for this, uh, both the book and this presentation. Uh, as Peter mentioned to you, I will talk about two things. One, the poll that my organization, Terra Free Tomorrow, conducted jointly with the New American Foundation in the FATA. And uh, this will complement what um, Hassan addressed about the nearby uh, um, uh, Kaktun, uh, Khyber Pakhtuna province. While much focus in 
on the Fatah deservedly has been on the militants there, as well as the United States drone strikes in the area, not as much attention has been paid to the actual people who live there and their point of view. And our public opinion survey, while not startling in some of its conclusions, I think gives an insight into where future policy might head. Here are some of the key findings, and they're set forth in the book in, in, in detail. Nearly nine out of every 10 residents in the Fatah region oppose U.S. military operations. And this is a, not a view that's lightly held. In fact, it's passionately, passionately and intensely held. And here's one measure of why. While only one in 10 people in Fatah, one in 10 Fatah residents of the tribal areas think that suicide attacks are ever justified against Pakistani military forces, almost six in 10 believe these attacks are justified against the United States military. Much of the, the antipathy towards the United States is, stems from one cause, and one cause really only, and that's against the CIA-directed drone strikes on militants living in the area. More than three-quarters of Fatah residents oppose these strikes. However, this opposition to American military policy does not mean that the people of Fatah embrace the Taliban or al-Qaeda. In fact, it's quite the opposite. Fewer than 10 percent uh, of the people in the, in, in the area supported the presence of al-Qaeda, and less than 20 percent supported the Pakistani Taliban. And here's a telling finding. We asked this question, which was Peter Bergen's idea, so I have to give him credit for it. On previous polls we had conducted, not with New America in, in, in Pakistan, he always suggested this question, and it's a brilliant one. We asked the people to pick who they would vote for in an election, and we listed al-Qaeda and Taliban as possible choices. Fewer than 1 percent of the people in Fatah said they would vote for either one of these groups. So the support for these groups is quite uh, 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 very uh, limited to a very small minority of people. Instead of supporting the militants, interestingly enough, nearly seven out of ten residents of Fatah want the Pakistani military, the Pakistani military alone and without U.S. help to come in and pursue the militants and take care of them in their area. It's a pretty stunning finding. So the popular support that these militants draw from is limited largely to response of American actions in the area. So as Brian alluded to, it's a tactic. It's certainly not a strategy, the drone strikes. Now, this is, was a fascinating finding. The antagonism towards U.S. policy was not coming from any kind of general anti-American feeling. In fact, almost three-quarters of the people in the tribal area said their opinion of the United States would improve most by a great deal if the United States provided humanitarian aid and, believe it or not, visas to work and study and come to the United States. So this is not some generally anti, we hate America, they're bad, they're this. Uh, it's very much related to the presence of drones and the military policy of the United States in the area. So while hating the drones above them, the people of Fatah, would welcome the chance to have the ground of America beneath their feet. As I said, the poll details are set forth in, 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 in the book. I'll, I'll just take a, another minute or two to uh, outline what I found out, which is kind of complementary to what Anand talked about, about the Taliban. And this is, in, in my book, Terrorists and Love, and, and based on my interviews with many uh, Taliban, um, both leaders and foot soldiers, and the role of Mullah Omar. According to the Taliban leaders and fighters I interviewed, the seminal event in securing and establishing Mullah Omar's authority as the undisputed leader or guide, they call it, of the Taliban, occurred in April of 1996 in Kandahar, southern Afghanistan. There, Mullah Omar wore, took from a, a religious shrine the holy relic of the cloak of the Prophet Muhammad. Simply by standing in the holy cloak's presence, the mute have walked out, speaking, the blind seeing, 
but only when a true leader from God stands before it will the holy cloak come out. This is what a Taliban leader told me. In fact, in the past 100 years, the cloak only came out, if you will. I know we have another association with that term, but anyway, that's the <laughs> closest they, I could translate it. Came out when the legendary King Amanullah wore it to save Afghanistan in 1929, and then again in efforts to stop a cholera epidemic in 1935. The prophet's cloak can be open only when touched by a true leader of the faithful, another Taliban told me. Mullah Omar had the right touch. So, so Allah Almighty opened the lock chest for him to wear the very cloak worn by the prophet Muhammad and be proclaimed the leader of the faithful. Now, as Anand talked about after the initial American victory in in Afghanistan at the end of 2001, Mullah Omar and his top leaders retreated to Quetta in Pakistan. Now, I received what, what Anand said is absolutely true. They didn't fight, and a lot of them were trying to do deals, et cetera, and this is very enlightening. I received a very different explanation for this, and you can take it for what, what it's worth. But as recounted to me, Umar, Mullah Omar was devastated by the Taliban's defeat. He was paralyzed with inaction, and he was taking up shop at a madrasa in Quetta. He couldn't decide what to do. In other words, he couldn't decide whether to launch holy war or not. The reason? He was waiting patiently for a true dream from God to tell him what to do. Now, that's what caused him to go to Kandahar to begin with, to wear the cloak of the, of the prophet Muhammad, was because he had a dream that foretold this. So only after a Taliban deputy, the, the leaders of the Taliban are sitting in this room, and a Taliban, dem, Taliban deputy, as recounted to me, told of his dream, and his dream was that he saw the beard of Mullah Omar turn a blinding white so that it was made of the very threads of the prophet's holy cloak. This was greeted with cries of Alu Akbar, praise God, and as told to me, this is why the Taliban took up holy war against the United States. This reverence for Mullah Omar I found among all the Taliban that I spoke to, uh, I, I'm not sure about the political implications of it, but they saw Mullah Omar as a spiritual, uh, almost a divine presence who would guide him. So I think whatever happens, the reverence for Mullah Omar among the rank and file is very strong, regardless of what faction there is. There's this religious aura around him. That concludes my mar remarks within eight minutes. <laughs> Great. Thank you. As mentioned, I'm Tom Lynch, and I want to thank New America uh, for having me here today. As already been mentioned by my co-authors, it is truly uh, an honor to be included in this uh, work, uh, particularly because of the terrific pieces and the distinguished chapters uh, by the authors that you've heard from today and several that uh, are not here today, uh, one of which I intend to allude to in my comments as I go forward. And in that context, I think the book is, is uh, special at this time, as has been alluded to already, because I think it still is very relevant and very important in terms of our understanding of this region, this Afghanistan-Pakistan region, now and going forward. Um, so thanks again to Peter Berg and Catherine Tiedemann for the inspiration uh, for this work and for the opportunity today. As I mentioned, uh, I'm a research fellow at the National Defense University, so I must uh, make this specific opening comment. The remarks I'm about to make, and indeed what's written in the chapter, chapter 14 of the book, uh, neither represent the position of my uh, host institution, the National Defense University, my ultimate employer, the Department of Defense, uh, but in fact represent my own research and conclusions, and I'm thankful for the opportunity provided by National Defense University uh, for that academic freedom and for the freedom to publish here in this book. In the text of the chapter inside uh, entitled The 80% Solution, The Death of Bin Laden's Al-Qaeda and the Implications for South Asia Security, uh, I make and, and, and work hard to justify uh, several points regarding uh, Al-Qaeda as constructed by Osama bin Laden and then the status of South Asian security and the implications for American policy subsequent to his death. Uh, my general thrust is in the following three areas. First, we still underestimate and underappreciate the significance of the death of Osama bin Laden to the essence of what al-Qaeda was, global al-Qaeda, al-Qaeda of a threat of an international and catastrophic terror nature. 
As a consequence, we misappreciate that bin Laden as a personality uh, was no less relevant to turning the ideology of Salafi jihadism, which had been a regional and a locally focused approach uh, in the Muslim world to understanding politics, into a cogent, globally threatening movement. And he was no less important in this than Lenin was to making a Marxist Bolshevism globally relevant through the communist and the co-option of the communist ideology. So much like Lenin was for global communism, bin Laden was a unique visionary, combining charisma and ability to communicate and to creatively fuse disparate and diffuse factions of the Salafi jihadi predisposition into something galvanized and formidable and therefore a menacing threat uh, to the West and to out of regional areas. The unique and acute problem posed by bin Laden's al-Qaeda was its credible effort to graft itself on top of the wider Salafi jihadi movement, and its once substantial progress at co-option uh, was brought together largely and in most uh, significant ways in the region we're talking about here, Talibanistan. Uh, so uh, I think that's important as a, as a marker as to why this is so important. In the chapter, I establish uh, and assess the five elements of bin Laden's al-Qaeda that made it a historically unique and uh, conspicuously severe threat, and then go on from there to argue about why that threat has receded and what implication that has for us to better appreciate the dynamics, the regional dynamics that underlie the present and the future uh, in South Asia, and particularly in Afghanistan and Pakistan. First, I argue that the five elements of bin Laden's al-Qaeda that made it unique was, one, that it aspired to be a core organization dedicated to planning, recruiting, and training for and organizing, and this is the important word here, catastrophic global terrorist events against Americans and other Westerners that they referred to as Zionist crusader targets, especially in Western homelands. And this was for a specific purpose. That purpose was to drive Westerners out of Muslim lands. <coughs> Second, Al-Qaeda's core element and principle was to serve as a vanguard for organizing and coordinating already existing regionally focused and locally focused groups towards acts of violence against what they referred to again as the American Zionist Crusader nexus in Muslim lands, where the presence was believed to defile Islam and bring it to a level that was unacceptable, again, for the purpose of driving Westerners out of Muslim lands. Third, and although a lesser aim, the goal of al-Qaeda as a core was to serve as an inspiration and a focal point for disaffected lone wolf Muslims worldwide to act out on their frustrations through violence against the symbols of perceived oppression against Islam in the Islamic world or in the Western world, again, for the purpose of driving Westerners out of Muslim lands. Okay, the fourth and fifth also very important, but at a lesser level, I argue here, and indeed many uh, scholars have re uh, argued about uh, Al-Qaeda's core, is was to serve as a brand name. Al-Qaeda representing kind of the highest level of Salafi jihad ideology in bringing successful violence ag against so-called crusader governments, in which the most senior Al-Qaeda leaders of the jihad remained free, and this was important, free from serious punishment, penalty, or harm. And here, this was indeed the kind of mystical notion of al-Qaeda prior to the raid against bin Laden in Abbottabad that was the notion of impunity, that bin Laden and to a lesser extent Zawahiri were immune from justice and they could hide out beyond the arm of contemporary international law. And fifth, that al-Qaeda would serve, and this is also important from the notion of Talibanistan, uh, serve as a base certain for the conquest of Afghanistan and uh, included in that is their notion of Western Pakistan in the name of global jihad. And this was important because of the mystical origins about where al-Qaeda had come from and how it had built up in the end of the anti-Soviet jihad period in Afghanistan itself. Now, I argue in the piece here that these five essential elements of bin Laden's al-Qaeda, three of them were completely devastated by the raid in Abbottabad, and the passing of time has eroded by about 50% the other two. First, the notion of al-Qaeda as a brand name that was free from retribution or had impunity against being attacked and captured, that was exploded, literally, and the manner in which, and the finality of which, bin Laden met his end. Uh, to most of us who followed jihadi websites, uh, we saw in the traffic uh, shortly after bin Laden's death, uh, certainly for a period of two to three months, that this notion of how could this have happened was followed by the claim and the desire to have revenge, a revenge that in many ways has never yet been served up. But the notion of al-Qaeda as disputed leader living with impunity and living above and beyond the law, that came crashing down by way of this raid, and other groups, other Salafi regional groups, I would argue to you, have exploited 
exploited that for their own benefit and for their own standing within this wider movement. Second, the essential idea of al-Qaeda as the premier Salafi jihadist organization able to plan, recruit, and then conduct successful terrorist operations overseas that had been already eroding over the previous five to six years uh, really came down uh, on the heads of uh, the uh, organization with the death of Midlan. Indeed, uh, we can show in our intelligence that Pakistan was, and the locus of al-Qaeda central, was the point of many plots since 2006. But the Western governments, largely due to their own efforts, and we can talk about that in question and answer, in terms of understanding, identifying, and being able to monitor the movements of al-Qaeda, really were very successful in taking would-be plots and disaggregating them into unsuccessful plots. Indeed, since the attack in the um, uh, northern subway system uh, in London, England in 2005, there has not been a commensurate, significant, and substantive attack in the Western countries, and yet there have been dozens of intercepts and uh, dis dissembling uh, of uh, terrorist acts, and I talk about some of those here in uh, the uh, chapter, uh, and talk about how that has led to a dilution of the uh, credibility of al-Qaeda as a global catastrophic movement. Uh, finally, there's this critical notion of al-Qaeda as a base certain for conquest in, in Afghanistan. Uh, that's a long-standing and critical notion to the base and to the core. This too was dashed, and I think it's important here for the for the the work in the piece about the South Asia to understand this, as I argue in the chapter, uh, that uh, the relationship between Bin Laden and Mullah Omar, as well as the Haqqani network and several other Taliban groups, was really personal in terms of the relationships between the leaders. I lay out in some detail the fact that Zawahiri and the Egyptians never swore a similar baya or a similar oath, and to this day Zawahiri has not. Although he is um, elliptically referred to still respecting Mullah Omar, uh, he has never sworn the same kind of bayat, and therefore the ideological linkage to al-Qaeda matters far less to Mullah Omar and folks like Haqqani and Ahmadiyyad these days um, than the vital strategic link they have to Pakistan and its military intelligence establishment. Indeed, what I argue has occurred uh, undisputably uh, with the death of bin Laden is that uh, Pakistan's national objectives don't align with al-Qaeda or internationally. Indeed, they don't align even with the Pakistani Taliban's aspirations to eliminate the Pakistan government itself. And as a consequence, Islamabad has uh, incentives to constrain and to limit the effect of the Afghan Taliban uh, going forward in manners that do not represent the wider Salafi jihadi movement. And so my argument in this piece is that the loss of the three critical elements and the erosion by 50% of the other two uh, due to the U.S. campaign and due to the continuous pressure uh, changed what I define and put into place an 80% solution to the problem of al-Qaeda, bin Laden's al-Qaeda of global catastrophic terrorism. Now, where does that leave us in South Asia? And here, the latter two-thirds of the piece, I discuss in some detail uh, how uh, it leaves us with an underappreciation of the need to rethink our strategy going forward in South Asia. Uh, almost a year ago, I finished this piece, and I argued um, in three areas, for the wider region, for Afghanistan, and for Pakistan, a proper understanding of this schism between the Taliban's uh, aspirations and al-Qaeda's make it important uh, for us to adjust the way in which we view moving forward with the quote in game in Afghanistan which I argue should be an interim game and here's the points I make and I will update them briefly on where I think things have adjusted or adapted specifically within the last year first two points about the wider region uh, I think the war in Afghanistan needs to be reconsidered uh, as it's always been viewed in Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Indian circles, and that as is as a Pakistani-supported rebellion in Afghanistan against the Tajik, Uzbek, and Hazra-dominated government of the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan with significant links in New Delhi and Tehran. And only a fig leaf of Pashtun representation in the form of President Hamid Karzai, who is completely mistrusted in Pakistan as too cozy with India. Now. That point, I don't think, is yet resonated in the West, and has certainly not resonated yet uh, several streets down uh, in this government. I think there's a grudging uh, and slowly evolving understanding, but not yet one that, under, that puts us enough in a policy frame of mind to address the subsequent points I'm going to make. The second regional implication is, again, to state that with bin Laden dead, the critical mass of al-Qaeda's core in Western Pakistan eliminated and severely compromised, the essential dynamics in Afghanistan are those with regional rather than with international import. 
support. Fundamentally, the war in Afghanistan is an Indo-Pakistani proxy war between nations that have fought each other in shooting wars and indulged in several other martial conflicts since 1947. And these are layered on top of the ethnic cleavages within Afghanistan and the, 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 the poise for action between them, as Brian has alluded to, in my estimation, is great and growing ever stronger as each day passes going forward. And again, I think too little U.S. and Western understanding of this and insufficient attention to the obligations for a residual U.S. diplomatic and military presence to try to cleave together that which we have now armed and put at a better footing uh, is important before it breaks apart and moves in separate directions. Implications in Afghanistan. And I'll skip two of the three I had here to save time for questions. The critical notion is that, uh, led by the United States, uh, the coalition in Afghanistan must now shepherd reconciliation talks among the Afghan government, the Taliban, and representatives from Pakistan's military and intelligence services to show how a more federal system in Afghanistan can meet both Pakistani and Taliban aims while preserving the basic framework of an Afghan republic as opposed to a return to an emirate. And here, I think there is some room for cautious optimism, although there is a great blowback and a backlash about the recent High Peace Commission in Afghanistan's Roadmap to 2015 plan which to me, in this framework that I've developed and that I really believe in, is encouraging because it shows there's a recognition that the Taliban, Pakistani leaders, and Afghan leaders, each of who hold different aspirations and ideations, must come together and produce a more confederal and a structure that allows for a more southern Pashtun representation, not all of it which is Taliban, but some of it which is, that allows that inclusion in order for us to have a res reasonably peaceful future. And finally, with respect to Pakistan, where I think the implications are most grievous, because Pakistan as a country is really the fulcrum of the issues that uh, present themselves now moving forward in Afghanistan. First, I think American policy must do better at uh, resolving unilaterally attacking Al-Qaeda's Al -Qaeda's remaining core leaders or mid-level Afghanistan Taliban figures to their last breath in Pakistan, and specifically here with drone strikes. I think we still too much are using uh, drone strikes um in the, the western region of Pakistan, and indeed I've called for us to halt them uh, temporarily and restructure them, although my next point is that I think we are in fact starting to see a limited recalibration of how drone strikes are being used, not in a manner that I think is overt and explicit enough to dampen the unhappiness with them in Pakistan, which I still think is extant and very important, but rather in a manner where for the first time since back in 2008-2009, I see activities in the last five or six months with drone strikes starting to converge around both Pakistani interests in inhibiting Tariqi Taliban Pakistan and also American interests in dampening uh, the international forces of terrorism, where I think the U.S. and Pakistani interests converge, even though they don't converge on the elimination of people like Haqqani and, and um, Mullah Omar. And specifically, I point to the same event uh, that Brian talked about, uh, and indeed then the subsequent ones, which has to do with the death of Commander uh, Mualvi Nazir uh, in South Waziristan on January 2nd. Uh, a long-standing tribal ally of the Pak Mill and ISI, uh, relations between Nazir and the Pakistani state uh, have soured, uh, despite their importance, over the last year. Indeed, Nazir uh, undertook a November uh, 2011 alliance with Tariqi Taliban Pakistan and the Masoods, and that is actually detailed in one of the chapters in this book, uh, the chapter number five about uh, uh, Pakistan's Taliban by Masoor Khan Masood, uh, and therefore puts Pakistan in a position of actually, and coincidentally, uh, being willing to allow for U.S. assistance uh, in uh, eliminating uh, um, uh, Nazir's from his role, his critical role. Indeed, subsequent to that, several members of the Mashud tribe in the Tariqi Taliban Pakistan, including supposedly the uh, suicide um, attack uh, coordinator, a cousin of Hakimullah Massoud, a guy named uh, Wali, Masood, uh, Wali Muhammad Tafoon, have been killed over the weekend. And my argument here is those types of killings would not be happening without more than Pakistan acquiescence at this point, okay? Uh, they, there's more than enough they could do to inhibit that. So I think that's important. And so some cautious optimism for us retaining the relationship there and moving in a direction to find mutual common cause while acknowledging that there's not common cause. Finally, I think we need to most importantly, diplomatically, help Pakistan work quietly with India to find the necessary accommodation in Afghanistan to inhibit the possibility of a reckless proxy war between two nuclear armed states that could seriously threaten calamity both in the region and of a global import. And I 
fear, unfortunately, that there is too little movement in this area right now, and there's not enough focus on that as a critical dynamic in the region. As a consequence, progress and understanding by the U.S. and the West in some of these areas and the critical dynamics that exist uh, after the 80 percent solution to the global catastrophic problem of terrorism from bin Laden's al-Qaeda and the growing problem of looming proxy war uh, and come civil war in Afghanistan uh, is evolving since my time of writing, but not fast enough and not near enough with the alacrity. And I really worry and, and I'm concerned uh, that we do uh, very diligent work in the next weeks and months to craft a residual diplomatic and military component uh, in Afghanistan that is sufficient enough to show concern, strong enough to show bonding uh, in an otherwise fractious military, and strong enough uh, to provide us a presence in South Asia, which faces a very uh, difficult security future that is quite independent of actors from the global jihad. Thank you. I'll try to be brief so we can get to questions quickly. Um, basically, the paper that I wrote for, or the, the chapter in this was uh, trying to address the question of why the Pakistani military strategy um, during, since 2002 has either been limited, selective, or anemic at, at certain times. Uh, and I, you know, I go through that a, a bit in the paper to essentially explain, you know, an answer to the question that Secretary of State Clinton posed uh, in 2009, which is, you know, why exactly is the Pakistani government willfully abdicating to the Taliban? Um, there have been a lot of explanations that have been offered. Uh, I think one that gets used a lot is sort of the strategic, the strategic utility of militants. Another is just sort of outright duplicity and that, you know, there's uh, some Pakistani interest in maintaining a certain level of insurgency to extract uh, resources from the outside world, from U.S., NATO uh, allies. I think there's also a plausible sort of simple rationalist explanation for this, and that's just the costliness of such a venture, of having such a comprehensive strategy to tackle um, – all variants of, of militil, uh, militants, militancy in, in uh, both the tribal areas and, you know, Khyber Pakhtunwa and, and the rest of the country. Um, it comes down to, you know, what I think is money, manpower, and materiel. And I sort of outlined the costs that Pakistan has borne over the last um, 10 years in, in the chapter. And, and I think it's, it's because of these costs that they've absorbed, particularly since 2007, that shapes the anticipation of future costs and fears of what, you know, the future might hold should they go whole hog into Fatah, North Waziristan, and future operations. Um, it's, it's just worth uh, paying attention to what Pakistan says or what Pakistani military leaders or, or state leaders say about what the costs that they've borne, because I think we are generally not attuned to this. Uh, I thought it was striking when um, there were some news reports that suggested the GHQ re released a report saying they had lost about two brigades of manpower, just outright manpower from their military, and the operational equivalent of two divisions, which is dramatic. Uh, and this was, you know, this might be inflated, but this was based on estimations of the retraining costs and the retraining time, the replacement of materiel costs, um, the reorganization costs that were required to sort of patch up these two divisions. But that was pretty significant. It's, it's not, you know, for a military that is, has a hostile eastern border and potentially a western one as well, um, this is not an insignificant cost. And it's something that doesn't get talked about a lot in, in the United States in terms of assessing what Pakistan can afford to do and what costs it can bear. Another cost that uh, gets unnoticed, I think, is the level of violence that sort of hit the urban and core centers of Pakistan post-2007, particularly post the Lal Masjid uh, siege operations. Um, the numbers are staggering. I was just looking through some of the data recently, and if you look at the six-month window pre and post um, uh, that, that Lal Masjid operation, the amount of violence that hit and racked the, the urban areas, and, and uh, uh, not just of uh, Fatah and Khyber Pakhtunwa, but also Punjab and Islamabad, uh, you know, the, the number of attacks increases m maybe like two to three times, but the, the amount of casualties goes up maybe 20 to 25 times uh, in just within a, sh a short period of time. And Pakistani military, Pakistani government states that they believe that these attacks, you know, are likely to come again in the future should they take on, you know, certain, certain other operations like in North Waziristan against the Haqqani network. This was a, a profound sort of, you know, concern that was voiced to me repeatedly uh, right after Admiral Mullen's statements in 2011 about, um, uh, you know, about the Pakistani government not doing much about the Haqqani network and that it's sort of being sort of an arm of the ISI. Uh, the explanation that I routinely got, and again, this is, you know, 
can be taken with a grain of salt, but nevertheless should be sort of thought about, is if the Pakistani military really did actively go into that and they described it as the hornet's nest, there would be an alliance of militant and jihadi networks that would sort of align against the Pakistani state and bring that same level of violence that had the Pakistani experience from 2007 to 2009, which basically crushed the Pakistani public uh, and, uh, and the military, uh, and that would return again. And that was something that they greatly feared. So there's a degree of calibration as to how much you can do given the cost that you would have to absorb or cost you'd have to bear. Uh, that I think sort of motivates or sort of, motivates sort of the limited strategy the Pakistani state has uh, uh, utilized. Another question that sort of comes up a lot is the issue of selectivity. That you know they distinguish between good Taliban versus bad Taliban. Uh, I'd like to hold that aside for a second and say that the selectivity is not just about sort of the target or the uh, the insurgent group, but it's also about the territory that's being contested. Um, I believe uh, Hassan referred to you know the distinction between uh, settled versus unsettled areas. This is something that resonates in terms of how Pakistan's calibrates strategy. Unsettled areas are sort of expected to be frontier areas, they're expected to be lawless. There's a degree in which militancy or armed militias or uh, the lack of state control, the lack of Weberian control, to put use Anand's uh, term, is acceptable. And this is something that we, ha we have a very hard time grasping in the United States or in the Western world because this, uh, you know, our, our concept of, of the, Weberian, the Weberian state is meant to be uh, total and throughout the entire territory of a country, and this doesn't exist in, I'd say, most parts of the world. It doesn't exist in Pakistan. It doesn't exist in Afghanistan. It doesn't even exist in India, which is, you know, arguably a democratic ally and, you know, much more capable and stronger state. And so I think dispensing with that idea will help to understand where the Pakistan state goes big, for example, in SWAT, where they're much more comprehensive in terms of their strategy, in terms of their manpower, uh, their, you know, concern about civilian casualties, et cetera, uh, versus in, in South Waziristan and other operations in Fatah, which have been far more limited in scope and strategy. Um, I think, and a, th a third thing I just think we need to bear in mind is the degree to which public opinion constrains Pakistani state, even though we sometimes think of it as, as even under the Musharraf era, as not in a democratic state, but an authoritarian one, there is still audience costs that every leader has to pay, whether it's an authoritarian, autocratic government, or a democratic one. And in terms of utilizing force against your own people, it's something that we don't have to think about because we, we authorize force to go, you know, be deployed elsewhere. And the only cost that the, the American public bears in terms of counterinsurgency operations are uh, fiscal costs and, you know, obviously the loss of our, our, our troops and our loved ones. But um, in Pakistan, it's also about, it's not just a strategic cost, it's also the political cost of authorizing force against their own people, especially if they're important constituent groups. Uh, the base of the, this insurgency in the, in the militancy in uh, the Fatsa and Khyber Pakhtunwa is the Pashtun uh, ethnic community, which is not an insignificant community in Pakistan. It's actually a very key, pow, state, uh, key stakeholder in the state, in the military. And so the idea of trying to utilize force against it is much harder to stomach, both for politicians as well as military leaders as well. Um, I'll leave it at that so we can go to questions. stimulating presentation. We have uh, not a huge amount of time for questions. Um, it, can you, uh, if you have a question, it's a, really a question, not a statement. Uh, state your name, wait for the microphone, and uh, if it's directed to a certain person, say so. So in the back here, this lady here. Hi, uh, thanks so much for being here. My name is Christine Vargas. I'm a recent graduate of uh, Johns Hopkins Science Strategic Studies program. Uh, my question, I think, is most pertinent to Brian. It has to do with stratcoms. What can we do effectively these days to interrupt Taliban stratcoms and insert messages of our own? Um, not a whole lot, I think. Um, <laughs> You know, I think it's it's really important when when we when we talk about strategic communications to recognize that um, you know oftentimes you you get this dynamic where we think about operations and then we think about strategic communications, and that's that's clearly wrong, right? Actions speak louder than words, and it doesn't matter what we say if uh, what people are responding to are drone strikes, and that's what they're going to respond to. And I'm not convinced that actually the drone strikes are 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 as important as is is sometimes. Uh, people think they are. But um, I think the, the most important thing that we can do is to eliminate any sense that there's a gap between our actions and our words, even if our actions are unpopular, right? We just need to explain what we're doing. 
state clearly why we're doing it. Peter Bergen actually wrote an op-ed in the New York Times a long time ago um, saying that we should acknowledge drone strikes, right? And at the time, I thought he was crazy, but I came to actually agree with him. Um, and uh, and and I, this is the point, right, is that um, we have a story to tell. It's not going to be popular a lot of the time, but we need to explain that very clearly. When I said that militant groups try to create myths, what that means is that we counter those myths when we tell the truth, right? Fundamentally, when we tell the truth and we tell it clearly, we are countering the myths that terrorist organizations and insurgents try to create to enhance their own power. And so when you just objectively state the truth, that is a strategic communications policy, and that's what we ought to be doing about these guys. At the end of the day, um, certainly al-Qaeda and major elements of the Taliban have very little to offer from, from a sort of governance standpoint. They're not that popular, as Ken indicated. Um, and so what we want people to be doing is assessing those organizations on their own merits. Right. And we don't want to get in the way of that process. Right. So we want to sort of set ourselves aside and keep the onus on the terrorists, the onus on the militants to establish their own credibility because they have a hard time doing that. In front of you, Jennifer. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Malik Siraj Akbar. I'm a Pakistani journalist. My question is to Dr. Hassan Abbas. Last week, Pakistani military unveiled a new strategic uh, counterinsurgency plan. Uh, can you speak a bit more about it, what it means for the transition in Afghanistan, or how, whether it's a policy of appeasement or of escalating uh, operations against the Taliban? Thank you. Great question. <clears throat> I think the, this new strategy or doctrine that is being talked about in Pakistani media, and General Kiani, the chief of Pakistan Army, has given a statement, three different statements. Uh, he has talked about a doctrine, but we, we have no exact document. What is believed is, and what is interpreted is, um, that Pakistan is, and Pakistani military and intelligence is actively um, supporting US negotiations with Taliban at one level. General Kiani went to Afghanistan, uh, met Karzai, um, invited the, um, some of the lead leaders there. There are 15 um, Taliban leaders who were in custody in Pakistan, though the official figure is 10 or 11, but I've heard a figure of 15 somehow. Um, 15 Taliban leaders who have been handed over, returned to Afghanistan. Um, there's some rumors about even a, a meeting um, that was arranged with Mullah Baradar as well, but he refused to go back um, and, in fact, was quite aggressive. The point I'm making, um, th this whole effort um, seems to me to be genuine, or I'll not s say um, un unless something um, contrary to this is proved. Uh, Pakistani strategic thinking has come to this conclusion um, that Taliban and the Pakistani version of it and all those independent militant groups indeed are a threat. Um, I would argue it is a bit late in the game. I really and earnestly wish this would have happened in 2007 or 8. Um, and th there was partly denial, partly delay. Um, now things are not as easy. It is much more complicated. Um, I would like to s believe that this is an honest um, effort. We have seen many other de related developments as well. The meetings, increased meetings between uh, United States government and Pakistan uh, government at the senior levels. Um, um, General Kenny has been saying this in core commanders meeting and others. So I would argue if this was um, a, a facade or this was um, a, a, not a well coordinated, well thought out policy, then we would not have seen as many statements. But from the previous developments, we have seen the peace deals. Um, if again, there's any peace deal which will empower any of the militant, that will be problematic. I think it is a flawed belief uh, if we think that a negotiated settlement with Afghan Taliban will make it easier for Pakistan to deal with TTP and militants in Pakistan, that's flawed. Uh, the reason is empowered Taliban or even I would argue Mullah Omar, a Mullah Omar as governor of Kandahar, or Taliban in a power coalition in Afghanistan, uh, that will inspire and motivate Pakistani side of militants. 
Um, so I don't think that by dealing with negotiations in Afghanistan, it will automatically make it easier for Pakistani military intelligence to deal with the Pakistani side of Taliban. That threat will remain there. And, the, and military action and drone policy, to be frank, um, uh, has not delivered the dividends. Military option has absolutely failed to deal with Tehreek Taliban Pakistan or even I, I would argue, sorry, to deal with Taliban on the Afghanistan side. Um, I hope that this military strategic change is also in parallel to that. There is some new vision and some new thinking also, which will tackle the ideological um, space that has been taken over by the militants. That military cannot do anything about it. Only continuation of democracy, only progressive religious discourse and more education can do that. So even if Pakistani military has changed its doctrine, it can only have a limited impact. I would argue I would like to see a much broader effort to deal with these issues. Thank you. Okay, we're going to take three questions here. We're going to bunch them together because we're actually pretty much almost out of time. Uh, and so make the questions short and make the answers short. Thank you. Hossein Shabazi from Webster University. I really uh, thank you for the very informative and analytical uh, uh, presentations. I have actually two questions, and uh, one is uh, uh, to uh, the, uh, Mr. Gopal. Uh, y when you, one of your main uh, argument is that uh, today is, is pretty uh, good situation or good environment for pursuing, you know, negotiation because of. Uh, uh, a similar situation took place as you described in 20, 2004. Now, I want to know in the in light of all the things we know or we heard about what the government is perceived by the Taliban and the U.S. is, uh, you know, uh, and the uh, polling about the Americans, why would you say that Americans, uh, the uh, Talibanese are in the situations that would find this today's uh, good time as they were as they saw it in early 2000 when they were very much on uh, run uh, Could you please uh, elaborate more and the other question is uh, to mr. Lynch or Lawani is that uh, in passing is I heard something about India and Iran I like to some uh, more on that to see whether uh, Iran and India together or individually have any role in, uh, in, in the play as you all discussed. Thank you very much. Okay, and the lady next to you Hi, uh, Katie from the Department of State. Um, Mr. Boss, you linked the, or kind of referenced, uh, the growth of TTP to the lack of support received by the Pakistani civilian law enforcement um, bodies. I just wanted to see if you could kindly clarify whether the support you were looking for there was financial or, or domestic political will, um, and why don't you think that support was provided to you? And the gentleman behind. Hi, Knox Thames with the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. This is a question for Professor Abbas and Mr. Gopal. Um, just the role of religion, the narratives that the Afghan Taliban offer and the Pakistani Taliban offer are often couched in religious terms. Does that play with the populations of Talibanistan? Is this something that, that brings people closer to them or... Uh, or is it just political verbiage in a different dressing? Thanks. Okay, and we have the answers have to be like 30 seconds, please. Sorry, because we've got to wrap it up. Mine will be brief on, in case of police reforms, the reason there was not investment in police reforms in Pakistan is because of sheer incompetence. Um, it is, of course, that leads to lack of political will. I'll also criticize the U.S. government as much as I'll do Pakistan government. Uh, the reason being, and this I'm talking about the 2001 to 2008 period, not last three, four years, when U.S. has started doing actually well and by looking at this police also as an important institution. But why from 2001 to 2008, all these departments and organizations in the U.S. never thought about counterterrorism as a civilian law enforcement issue? Good point. Okay, Anand. Uh, uh, the, the, there's elements of the Taliban who believe that this is uh, the right time to negotiate because they don't think that the 90s Taliban will be reconstituted. There are others who disagree with that, but that, that's essentially why they think this is the time to negotiate, um, because they think they, they won't win. Hey, and a quick follow up to that, did the surge work? at least on that level, in, in getting the Taliban to think that there's no chance of uh, military success? 
Yeah, the, the surge, I think, successfully halted the momentum of the Taliban. It didn't reverse the momentum, and it didn't put the, the United States or any other uh, actor in Afghanistan in a position to win, whatever that may mean. But it, it, I think it did uh, halt uh, momentum, and that it informs this position, I think. Uh, and the role of the religion and the Taliban, you know, the sort of the the ideological battles that are that play out in the countryside are very much couched in terms of religion. So the Taliban are rooted um, in the countryside as, as mullahs and as people who sort of have a monopoly on religious discourse. And this is why the Afghan government and other uh, actors try to sort of compete with the Taliban on that ground. Hmm. Yeah, just quickly, you asked a question about India. Um, I'd refer you to the chapter in the book, uh, but India has a critical role to play in my estimation, and that's because the narrative of what Afghanistan is, as played in a South Asian lyric, is that Afghanistan uh, is in play uh, between India and Pakistan, all right, and that the individual tribes in the country of Afghanistan align in one way or the other, rightly or wrongly, uh, with um, uh, either Indian interests or Pakistani interests, and Pakistan's military intelligence apparatus not wishing to see India advantaged either to perpetuate mischief from Afghanistan against its ethnic minorities within the country or to gain decisive advantage geostrategically in Afghanistan really um, mistrusts fundamentally what it sees presently in Kabul as a uh, New Delhi-leaning uh, government, and that America and Western efforts have been um, either intentionally or more likely uh, inadvertently because of sheer naivete uh, instrumental in giving India a leg up in the country and one that cannot be tolerated for the long term. I, I, I would argue that you know Iran matters in the country, but nowhere near as much to the uh, continuation of violence as does the Pakistan-India dynamic. Iran will play, and Iran, if you've been to Western Afghanistan, uh, is is pretty heavily invested and embedded there, uh, as it is with some of the Hazara community in Afghanistan. But I would argue to you that that's nowhere near as significant in terms of dictating the level and the degree of violence as is the interplay between India uh, and Pakistan interests in the tribal relations. Any final observations? Anybody? Thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you.